We can't live in history, but history can live in us. As Cranky Sheilas and Company, we aim to have some history live today, using the lives of people who have already affected your life. Who were they? There was Muriel, Dora and Annette There was Edith and Louisa, Rose and Emma too Mary Lee, Jessie Rook and Margaret Who were they? The ones who swore for votes Who were they? Wrote the articles and notes Who were they? Who made the rallies run? We should know their names There was Muriel, Dora and Annette There was Edith and Louisa, Rose and Emma too Mary Lee, Jessie Rook and Margaret Who were they? Dora and Annette There was Edith and Louisa Rose and Emma too Mary Lee, Jessie Rook and Margaret Who were they? The men who helped them stand Who were they? The men throughout this land Who were they? The partners and the mates Of the women who were able who were they? The women of the South Who were they? The ones who stood in line Who were they? The steadfast and the brave We should know their names Although they now have long been in their we unashamedly play the gender card because we are relating the lives and actions of 10 intelligent, compassionate, resilient and of course daring women. Their actions highlight the strategies used to gain the vote for women in Australia. It took decades and although New Zealanders and Australians led the field in gaining the vote, international cooperation aided the struggle. Monologues are used to tell each suffragist's story. Not quite the vagina monologues, but there were definitely many people with vaginas involved. Interjections of comments made by men who were against women's suffrage, used in hindsight, are ironically funny. Doubly ironic when you think of the remarks made during the last election campaign. Think of the interjections as 19th century tweets. You will hear songs and poems. As a singing group, we're not quite Pussy Riot. Remember them? But an Australian near riot does get a mention. After much research, writing songs was my starting point for constructing the show. Several of these suffragists were performers of one kind or another, and some songs were crafted from the writings of the suffragists themselves. You will see relevant images, including those of men who assisted in overcoming the resistance and abuse from, dare I say the word, misogynists. Some other terms need clarification. The word franchise does not only belong to such as Red Rooster, Gloria Jeans and McDonald's. They wore very large hats and very long dresses. 
They used hat pins and plaits to harness their tresses. They recited and sang when they gave addresses. They put up with pain and myriad pinches from corsets and girdles that reigned in their inches. They felt they were caught in a torturous winches. The term should have been suffragists. Women are shrieking cockatoos. The honourable gentleman needs to be informed that with cockatoos, it is the male of the species who shrieks, as he has just demonstrated. My name is Henrietta Dugdale. I am a believer in true ethics rather than religious morality. So I believe in temperance, birth control, and applying the knife to rapists. Education is what we need, I say. Education for women and education for the poorer classes. Using the name Ada, I had been writing letters to the Melbourne paper, The Age, since 1869 about various issues important to women before I realized that women needed to band together in order to see change. Using knowledge of the first suffrage society in the world, in England, I started the first suffrage society in Melbourne in 1884. Soon such societies sprang up all around Australia. They waxed and they waned for the next few decades. But women alone cannot make this necessary changes. Here in Victoria, our efforts to gain the vote, we have been helped by some far-sighted men. One was Dr. William Maloney, a lover of art and artists. He was a dandy dresser often wearing red or yellow ties and Panama hats. Oh. And he introduced this first suffrage bill into the Victorian Parliament. When I was 16, I found the way we dressed in corsets and long skirts was really bad for our health and the health of the, women, of the children that we carried. So, one by one, I broke the bones in my corsets until there were none left. I designed my own clothes in a much freer fashion. I urged other women to do exactly the same. Women, I said, it's time to throw aside artificial modesty. I tell you, it is a woman's duty to try and raise other women. As a pianist, I loved playing Chopin and Beethoven and they helped me to fight the corset. As I sat playing their music, I would hammer out my frustration. Oh no, I won't wear a corset. Oh no, I will not wear stays. Oh, no, I won't wear a girdle. I want to feel free for all of my days. Henrietta wouldn't let a corset fetter her. Henrietta knew a better way to dress. She came up with a design that suited her just fine. And didn't put her body under stress Oh no I will not wear whalebone Oh no I will not be laced Oh no Not for me a chastity belt No should be enough for me to stay chaste. That's if I choose, of course. <laughs> Henrietta was a chartist and an artist. She could hold her own in print or on the stage. Her rendition of a skirt so meant that dressing didn't hurt so much. And soon her fashion statement was the rain. Oh yes, I'll change the hemlines and not 
just for the young. I want to make my body free, along with my brain, my thoughts, and my tongue. In a bus you cannot dive into the water. You can't hurdle in a girdle or in stays. A hemline that is shorter will bring freedom to your daughter. Change the law and change the vote for better days. Oh no, I won't wear a corset. Oh no, I will not wear stays. Aha, uh -huh, Mrs. Louisa Lawson, a uh, big boned as befitting a countrywoman. Eh? <laughs> and why shouldn't a woman be tall and strong? Being tall and strong, I was able to toss away this wedding hat of mine. I was strong enough to leave an unhappy marriage and move from Gulgong to Sydney. And most importantly, I was strong enough to start the first woman's magazine in Australia in 1888. I am Louisa Lawson. And if I was to publish a woman's magazine in Australia in the 21st century, I would not be worrying about which daughter of a prime minister I would put on the cover. I had more important issues to put in my headlines. I wrote in defense of others who needed to be strong. My magazine did give household and fashion hints, but mainly it discussed the unfairness of the treatment of women, both here and overseas. I was the eldest daughter of a largish family, and by that I mean in numbers, not in build. Poverty and the need to help at home meant I never had a chance to develop my singing skills even though some people wanted to send me abroad to study. My disappointments doubled when my mother burned my attempts at poetry writing. I think her actions scorched my soul. But my songwriting and singing skills were not entirely without influence because they fed into my son Henry's talents and I'm sure you've heard of him, Henry Lawson. I supported him by publishing his poems along with my own and those of other women in The Dawn. The magazine leaned to the left but was, and was spurned by the trade union movement because at one stage I employed women over men. No, the unions did not like that. I published statements like this. A woman's opinions are useless to her she may suffer unjustly, she may be wronged, but she has no power to weightily petition against men's laws, no representatives to urge her views. Her only method to produce change is to ceaselessly agitate. Opposition came from without and within the suffragist movement, perhaps because by nature, I'm not given to social niceties or a display of personal emotional needs and this may have upset some people, but through the long years of struggle for franchise, I did receive support from some very prominent people, including a judge. Judge Windyer and his wife were especially loyal to me. And he was well known for presiding over the first rape case in New South Wales to secure a conviction. As I said before, I used poetry to express my hurt and concern for the plight of women, and this is one of them. The hour has come. How did she fight? She fought well. How did she light? Ah, uh, she fell. Why did she fall? God who knows all only can tell. Those she was fighting for, they surely would go to her. No. What of her pain? Theirs is the gain. Ever the way. Will they not help her to rise if there is death in her eyes? Can they not see she made them free? What if she dies? Can we not help her? Oh, no. In her good fight, 
It is so that all who work must never shirk suffering and woe. But she'll not ever lie down. On her head in the dust is a crown, jeweled and bright, under whose light she'll rise alone. Lil the Digger's Daughter is a song grown from a poem I wrote about a girl taught by her father to be strong. The Waratah has stained her cheeks, her lips are even brighter, like virgin quartz without a streak, her teeth are but far whiter, her eyes are large and soft and dark, and clear as running water, and straight as any stringy bark. She'll wash a prospect quick and well And deftly use the ladle The weight of gold that sight she'll tell And work with tub and cradle She was her father's only mate And wound up warm study late, sweet little the digger's daughter. She stood alone above the shaft, a test for woman. When I sprang to the windless shaft and helped her and her father, she turned her pretty face to me to thank me, and I thought her the grandest girl of all her race, sweet Lynn, the digger's daughter. And when my luck began to change, I grew a trifle bolder and told my love, but thought it strange. She knew before I told her, she said that she would be my wife, then hold my brow. A woman is as much out of place at the ballot box as a man is in the kitchen. Yes, oh. uh, ladies, uh, like cats, are best kept at home. So said Sir John Forrest, first Premier of Western Australia. He was Twiggy Forrest's great, great uncle, in case you are wondering. He quite forgot that cats do not stay at home. They travel, and they can climb fences. In 1893, it was the Kiwis who let the cat out of the bag. Suffrage was given to all women in New Zealand, the first in the world, but only the right to vote and not the right to stand for Parliament. The knife without the blade is the way they termed it, and they generously warned Australian women not to be so fooled. Support came also from the British and American women who visited and toured Australia. It was an international movement, with the Women's Christian Temperance Union playing a pivotal part. In 1894, South Australian women gained both rights, the right to vote and the right to stand. 
Women such as Mary Lee, Catherine Helen Spence and Elizabeth Webb Nichols were early untiring workers to gain this end. And they were assisted in South Australia by good blokes like Edward Charles Sterling. He was actually the first president of the South Australian Suffrage League in 1888. In Western Australia, the work of people like Edith Cowan and Lady Onslow had already assured a strong following for women's issues, but they, all the women were not federationists. It was fear of federation, apparently, that influenced some in power to give the women in Western Australia the vote. The reason being, they hoped that if women could vote, they would not vote for federation and therefore offset the pro-federation influence that was coming from an influx of noisy interstate miners. Monuments are inherently masculine and are therefore not a suitable form of memorial to a woman. That claim was made by the Perth Town Planning Commissioner, David Lomas Davidson, when a memorial clock was proposed to honour me for my extensive work in social advancement in Western Australia. I am Edith Dirksy Cowan, and I became Australia's first female member of a state parliament when I stood for the Nationalists in Western Australia in 1921, a seat I lost, unfortunately, in 1924. After quite a battle, the memorial clock was eventually erected. I was also given many other honours. My image is on a $50 note. A university and an electoral division are named after me. Yes, I was very honoured, unlike Louisa Lawson. There is so little public remembrance of her. The suffrage societies and the influence of magazines like Dawn helped increase the number of groups where women could be educated through reading. However, it soon became apparent that women needed to learn the skills of debating and public speaking if they were ever to win the right to vote. To this end, in 1894, I was inspired by a visiting American activist to turn St George Reading Circle, established in Perth in 1887, into the Karakata Club. Although the Dawn Club in Sydney was opened earlier, the Karakata Club was able to demonstrate a better result because the clientele was much higher on the social scale and closer to influential politicians. One such politician was Walter James, an independent member of parliament who supported the suffragist movement. He also supported my belief that sending more children to state schools would lead to a greater feeling of human sympathy because of wider social mingling. In 1879, I married the man who became Perth police magistrate, and that gave me great insight into social problems. I was the mother of five, so my life was very busy, but I was dedicated to social and political reform over decades. I already had a serious approach to life before my marriage. Two very emotional events influenced this. First, my mother's early death. Cause enough for a young girl to have a serious turn of mind. Then, my father married again. But his unhappiness in this marriage led to alcohol abuse. And in an argument, he shot my stepmother. For this, my father was executed. It should not be hard for you to imagine my grief and my pain, or why, like most of the suffragists, I was a fervent supporter of teetotalism. Perhaps because of this tragedy, I was more fervent than most. The Caraca. 
at a lady circle meets tonight They'll be talking and exchanging points of view The Karakata lady circle meets tonight To decide on what it is that they can do Side go see her on the star Circle meets tonight, but there'll be more than scones and knitting on display. They will hone our talk debating, cause they're getting tired of waiting. The lady circle circling for the fray. Side sip, go see her, we'll make a star. Promenade with crackers to show how it's hip they are. The Karakata Lady Circle meets tonight. Edith Cowan will be leading in the dance. She will definitely demand that alcohol be banned. Temperance girls give drink just Buckley's chance. Side sip, go see go and make a star. Promenade with crackers to show how set they are. With their eye on the prize, it's a victory for the wise. When the women win their franchise, shout hurrah. I say there's one thing uh, more detestable than another. It is an absolutely logical woman. Why, uh, one of the charms uh, of women is her unreasonableness. And who, I ask, would kiss a political woman? <laughs> I am Vita Goldstein. I was very political, but I must also have been seen as very kissable as I turned down many suitors. My eyes were on bigger things for women. I devoted my life to education and women's rights. I knew marriage would hamper this work. I was born in St Kilda in 1869 to parents who were devout Protestant Christians from Ireland. If you are thinking that the name Goldstein implies other origins, you are right. My grandfather was a Polish Jewish freedom fighter, so it was in my background to put up a fight too, and I did, for the vote and for peace. When it was realized that suffrage societies and clubs needed more action to back them up, we in Victoria created the Monster Petition 30,000 signatures collected over just six weeks. Nearly as good as get up. The petition claimed that women should vote on equal terms with men. The bill was tabled in Parliament in September 1891 with the support of then Premier James Munro. Not all the Premiers were supportive. A later Premier, Sir Thomas Bent, opposed me at every turn. He was a constant pain in the process. However, my social work and political exposure saw me invited to attend the International Women's Suffrage Conference in Washington in 1902, 
where Australia was praised and envied for its gains in women's suffrage. I also spoke at very large meetings in the UK. I was the first woman to stand for Parliament in Australia. I tried five times in Victoria, always on the principle of international peace. It was ironic that Victorian women were the first and most active suffrage movement, but last in Australia to win it for state votes. Perhaps my focus on peace in a country so willing to go to war was the problem. Encouraged by Dr. Charles Strong, a minister of the Australian Church, I helped establish the children's courts in Victoria and inspired Justice Higgins to fix the rate for a basic wage by making his criterion the needs for an average family. Yes, I travelled all the strands of the strategy thread very well. I was still protesting the atomic bomb in 1946 with words like these. Protest to be effective must be followed by resolute action. In Melbourne, a federal electoral seat was named after me. And in Portland, a, a different seat bears my name. And so became a big threat Missing out on Parliament Was her major regret Should have been a history star Vida, 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 Why have you been in from the pages of the history books With your fine mind and your good looks You should have been Just because some women pay taxes, that's not an excuse to give all women the vote. <laughs> hmm. 
they were happy to ignore the fact that some men didn't pay taxes and yet had the vote. My name is Maybank Anderson. I arrived in Australia from England at the tender age of 10 in 1855. I, my mother, Elizabeth Self, insisted I was educated as a teacher. She was a strong and decisive woman. I married Edmund Wollstoneholm, but 10 pregnancies and seven surviving children's la children later, he deserted me. So I had to survive as a single mother. At that time, my abiding interest in education led me to establish my large home in Marrickville as Maybank College, and I gained distinction as an educator. At that time, the women's movement was spreading and I became very involved in suffrage leagues. Debates in those days were a form of entertainment and some groups had their own debating teams. I remember one night in the Newtown Town Hall, well, only a few chairs were broken. But we never lost a debate. All this led to my publishing and editing a fortnightly paper called The Woman's Voice. I proposed it would be democratic, but not revolutionary, womanly, but not weak, fearless without effrontery, and liberal without license. I'm not a political woman myself, but for the simple reason that I think too much valuable time is wasted by politicians in personal quarrels. Some things never change. But education was my driving force. Without it, the vote would never come. Without it, the vote would be poorly served. And I knew education needed to begin early. So in 1895, I set up the first free kindergarten in Australia in Wollamaloo. In 1899, at the ripe old age of 54, I married Professor of Philosophy Francis Anderson, a bachelor aged 41. A true meeting of hearts and minds. I became increasingly devoted to university activities and organised associations to advise women students on self-help and opportunities. I also wrote poems, some of which may surprise you. Here are some excerpts. See if you can recognise which famous Australian poem was bounced off these. Our country. You may sing of English homesteads with their fields of yellow corn or the hedge of pearly hawthorn in the dewy summer morn. You may boast the calm, sweet beauty of the old home or the sea, but give me the yellow wattle and Australia young and free. Australia fair. Australia fair, I love thee, the dear land of my birth. To me, you are the sweetest, the brightest spot on earth. I love the golden sunshine, the sky of peerless hue, the soft greys in the distance, the hills faint tints of blue. I love the yellow beaches, the clear waves tipped with foam, the capes that stand like bulwarks to guard my native home. Dear Southern Land Australia, wherever I may roam, my heart will turn forever to thee, my native home. My poems were written at least 30 years before My Country by Dorothea McKellar, who used to live quite close to us. I may seem immodest, but I had a reputation as the most intellectual woman in Sydney. And my voice was once described as well-modulated, sweet, and not easily forgotten. But I didn't neglect my first role, so I continued to write songs and poems and educational material for young children. My very strong belief is that music aids brain development in children, and my hope is that down through the years, educators won't forget this. Well, they certainly have. Just ask good educators and Richard Gill. Here is one of my children's songs called Possum. Little Poss, pretty Poss, 
I want to know when weather's wet and cold, where do possums go? Hey possum, ho oh, possum, tell me true. When summer's gone, what do possums do? I found a hollow there in a tree. I wear a winter coat, snug as can be. Warm there, dry there, sleeping sound. With my nose between my toes and my tail curled round. Little Poss, pretty Poss, I would like to see what you have for dinner when you're living in a tree. Hey Possum, ho oh, Possum, what do you eat? Would you like bread and jam or would you like meat? Hey little boy, if I stay with you, I must have green and gum blossom too. Green leaves, young leaves, good food for me. But I'd rather go off and get some from a tree. Little pots, pretty pots, though trees are tall. You jump from limb to branch and you never fall. Hey, possum, ho, oh, possum, tell me true. When winds blow hard, what do possums do? See my sharp claws, they're very strong. They stick in the bark as I run along. Fine. Good clothes, and if they should fail, I can fall from the bow, but hold on by my tail. January 1901, Federation of Australian States. Australia's most important day since January the 26th, 1788. Not all suffragists supported Federation, but most Australians did. It happened. The first Australian Parliament was asked by Sir William Lynn, is it not a gross wrong to cut off from the right to franchise half of the people in this country who possess three quarters of its moral fibre? Perhaps his remark had influence. On June the 12th, 1902, Federal Parliament gave all Australian white women the right to vote and the right to stand. Unlike the New Zealand women, Australian women had forgotten the Indigenous woman. Aboriginal women in Australia had to wait until 1962 for uniform voting rights. Australian women too had to wait quite a few years for the right to vote and stand in all state elections. But their federal victory was hailed worldwide. When Vita Goldstein went to Washington, Australia was envied and the bright progressive band stretched out. Good afternoon. I am Alice S. Blackwell. When Vita Goldstein reached Washington for the International Women's Suffrage Conference in 1902, much of the world already knew Australian women had won suffrage. I was so thrilled by Australia's gains, and I was so inspired to write a song in praise of Vida Goldstein. She was such a vibrant speaker and such a beautiful young woman, and she gave us confidence that we too could gain suffrage. After all, she won high praise from President Theodore Roosevelt himself and from Congress when she addressed them. With some help, I would now like to present the song I wrote for Vida. The tune used here is one that was popular at the time, Isle of Beauty by Thomas Bailey. Australia's newfound calm. 
delegation suits her well. She has hopeful tales to tell. Modestly but undismayed with thoughts and figures, she comes well arrayed. She tells her tale with good. Of women are utterly incapable of doing the work of men. That was George Dibbs, New South Wales Premier. I am Rose Scott. Rose by name, Rose by nature. I was definitely a thorn in his side. I worked for measures to reduce men's power over women and to offer women options beyond marriage or prostitution. In my home education experience, I was influenced by Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew and by J.S. Mill's The Subjection of Women. These helped me to decide that a life spent in the service of just one man was a wasted life. Adopting my dead sister's boy gave me insights into education and I published an article in the Sydney Morning Herald in 1889 entitled Home Lessons, which condemned cramming and competitiveness in the education system. I often wondered if my views had any influence down the years. Not as long as we have NAPLAN. I was well connected to Sydney society and allowed my home in Wallara to become a salon where politicians, judges, philanthropists, writers and poets gathered. I tried my own hand at writing, a flippant limerick uh, aimed at the frivolous-minded occupation of some women. There was a young lady of fashion who for everything chic had a passion, thought it vulgar to vote, yet for hours would gloat on the latest way of tying a sash on. As a member of various leagues and societies, I fought for franchise and became skillful at using my social contacts and lobbying skills astutely and my feminine charms charmingly. I survived many internal disputes in the league. One very unfortunate split was with Louisa Lawson. We were so different. She, the wild bush wattle, and me, the garden rose. Opposition words inspired me to work harder. And with the strong support from journalist Harry Holland, I helped organise the Tayloresses Union of New South Wales in 1901. I wanted to say, there, Mr Dibbs, women can do the work of men. We won the right to the federal vote in 1902, but changing other laws was my purpose. I wanted to raise the age of consent to 16, and I wanted to make the public soliciting of prostitutes and abandoning a woman seduced under promise of marriage punishable offences. Such a bill was laughed out of court in 1892, which made me even more determined. My chance came in 1903. The work related to the abandonment of a woman seduced under promise of marriage. We campaigned for the release of Ethel Herringe, a young woman convicted for shooting her ex-employer at Cowra. We won. My portrait by John Longstaff is held by the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which is an honour to some degree. 
but it was my success with Ethel Herringe that I valued. This murder ballad tells the story. The parlour maid at a Cowra hotel was a comely lass who served drinks well. She has a murderous tale to tell. How bitterly bloomed the day. Ethel had a landlord, Morris John Lee, and they did what comes naturally. She thought she was his bride to be. How sweet or bitter, blow the winds of chance, and all the fallen leaves, leaves will spin and twist and dance. Ethel was pregnant with twins, it seems, but Morris John Lee would smash her dreams. He had entirely Morris refused her the right to his name Though his mother said Ethel had fair claim How sweet or bitter blow the winds of chance And all the fallen fallen leaves will spin and twist and dance Ethel set a date for November 19, with Palmer for witness and her sister Kathleen, a parson called Smith to complete the scene. How bitterly bloomed the day. Reverend Smith felt things weren't right. He wished he had stayed home that night. Just sign the papers and we'll fix this plight. How sweet of it all the winds of chance And all the fallen fallen leaves Will spin and twist and dance Marry me, Morris, it's the promise you gave Over my dead body, I'd prefer the grave His words became a cruel shockwave How bitterly bloomed the day She drew a gun from her milk-white breast One shot to his belly, one shot to his chest Her hand was grabbed, next shot did the rest How sweet or bitter blow the winds of chance and all the fallen leaves will spin and twist and dance. Ethel went to jail for willful murder. She begged, she pleaded, but no one heard her. Except Rose Scott, who became our crusader. How bitterly bloomed the day Rose rose up with the suffragists They raised their voices and they raised their fists The sentence changed by legal twist How sweet or bitter Blow the winds of chance And all the fallen mind the babies. <laughs> Look, if you give all women the vote, well, that means barmaids could vote. <laughs> you girls don't want votes. Yeah. You want something else. <laughs> Comments like that were thrown to me, at me along with rotten fruit. I am a Queenslander, Margaret Ogg, 
I was mercilessly heckled at one public meeting after another, not only by spontaneous individuals, but also by hired gangs. <laughs> See what I mean? Luckily, I had developed a flair for repartee. I credit this honing of skill to a position I held in support of my father, a Presbyterian minister, a position as superintendent of mission to seamen. I was homeschooled, taught to dress for dinner and to play the viola. When Tasmanian women won state voting rights since 1903 and Queensland had none, I began to think that these things are mere frippery. This caused me to increase my involvement with social change and the women's movement in Queensland. I set out to win the hearts and minds of, us, of Queensland country women. I was often refused transport and barred from halls for the early public meetings. So I toured the country in a horse and sulky, sometimes with a companion, but always with a trio of kerosene lanterns to light my street meetings. My idea of touring was taken up later in Britain. I edited the women's section of United Grazier and wrote poems under the name of Anne Dante. Out in the bush, here where for centuries the bush birds sang, and on the hills the natives hunted game, the rude beginnings of a township sprang. Out of a penal settlement our fathers came, worked, hoped, and dared, and stoutly willed to activate this city that we build. I didn't share the political views of many Australian suffragists. I was a monarchist and an anti-socialist. Proof that you don't need to be uniform in beliefs to join forces and help right a big universal wrong. Premier Arthur Morgan supported my work. Queensland women won voting rights in 1905, but I continued working for women. By 1913, I had become a lobbyist. Through my lobbying efforts, the old criminal code was rewritten to make domestic violence a criminal offence. Inheritance laws were first amended at last so that women could claim a part of their husband's estate. I acknowledge that it was my privilege to have as co-workers some of the finest women in Queensland. I used to tell them, in spite of all the things that you have done, there is one more thing that you must do, and that is stand up and wave the younger generation on. I was really glad when a creative arts scholarship was created in my name, and when voting rights were won, playing the viola no longer seemed to be a frippery. Nothing but cleaning and scrubbing, sewing buttons and darning socks, cooking the dinner and washing the dishes, letting down all the children's frogs. When these tiresome jobs get me under, I often sigh in vain for a self cleaning house. Be such a wonder or a tumble down castle in Spain. I'd like to get free from the chain for a spell when life seems stale and flat. Forget all the patching and all of the mending and other things like that.
the Bible, hey? Eh? The Bible says women must submit to their husbands. Mm. I did not know how submitting the law could make us be until my husband died. I am Dora. I was born in England in 1874, but I went to Sydney where I met and married Jewish merchant George Barrow Montefiore. I became Dora Montefiore, a fitting sounding name for a poet. We had two children. When George was lost at sea, my lawyer told me that as a woman, I had no automatic right to guardianship of my children. He could have left them to his mother or sister. I was stunned. That was when I, Dora Montefiore, became an advocate of women's rights. I held the first meeting of the Womanhood Suffrage League of New South Wales at my home in March 1891. But in 1892, I left Australia and settled in England, where I joined the recently formed Women's Social and Political Union. Writing poems helped alleviate the strong feelings for justice I felt. Not just for myself, but for all people. In 1898, I published a book of poems, Singings Through the Dark. She listened to the heartbeats of the people in their pain. She pondered social problems in her heart and in her brain. She dared for the first time to think and then to act. She flouted social fictions, changing social lie for fact. She saw infants doomed to suffering, maiden slaves to lust. She saw starving mothers barter souls and bodies for a crust. Saw workers crushed by sweat, heard the cry go up, how long? Saw the weak and feeble sink from competition's cruel wrong. She thought and lived quite simply, dignified by labour done, changing old world patterns for new freedoms hardly won. Clear-eyed and saved by knowledge, her ideals were fixed above to herald in new woman, the old perfect law of love. As a form of passive resistance in 1906, I refused to pay taxes because I claimed taxation without representation is tyranny and I barricaded myself in my Hammersmith home. After a six-week siege, my furniture was sold by the bailiff. I was later arrested and imprisoned for rowdily demanding votes for women in the lobby of the House of Commons. I joined several other suffragists in prison and we all wore this type of hat, not flattering, and neither was a prison sentence. After prison, I joined other socialists in various organisations. The metaphorical hat I wore then was definitely red. When G.K. Chesterton made an anti-Semitic attack on me, the Australian cartoonist Will Dyson supported me, as did Henry Holland, a well-known New South Wales socialist. In 1910, I visited my son Gilbert, an engineer who'd settled in Sydney. And while in Sydney, owing to the illness of Henry Holland, I edited his newspaper, the International Socialist Review of Australia, Australasia. I wrote editorials and caused controversy by castigating the introduction of compulsory military training for school-age boys. Back in England, I helped form the British Communist Party, and as a result, I was not allowed back in Australia to visit my son. In 1913, I helped evacuate starving Irish children. I was arrested for kidnapping and later released. I defended myself by explaining why. I was compelled into this action because in the gutter in front of our hotel in the main street of Dublin stood three garbage bins. Each bin was being searched furtively but rapidly by ragged kiddies from age four or five who threw the ashes into their bags and wolfed down the pieces of broken bread and meat that they found there among the garbage. How could I see that and do nothing? Dora Montefiora was a girl with lots of go. 
Go, Dora, go! She took on the establishment and struck a body blow. Dora Montefiore was the leader to be sure. Dora Montefiore, as she was not allowed to vote. Go, Dora, go! But they taxed her money and that got on her goat. Dora Montefiore was the leader to be sure. Dora Montefiore wouldn't pay the unfair tax. Go, Dora, go! They took away her furniture in trucks and great big sacks. Dora Montefiore was the leader to be sure. Dora Montefiore, she was sent to Holloway. Go, Dora, go! But she came out even stronger to fight another day. Dora Montefiore was the leader to be sure. Dora Montefiore tried to help some starving kids. Go, Dora, go! They scorned her a communist and set her on the skids. But Dora Montefiore was the leader to be sure. And Dora Montefiore should be kept in memory. Go, Dora, go! It is to the likes of Dora we owe our liberty. Dora Montefiore was the leader to be sure. To be sure. Something for the Irish. Man is the sturdy oak. Woman, the clinging vine. Yeah. Great. I was no clinging vine. I am Muriel Matters, born in 1877 in Adelaide into a Methodist family. By 1905, I was aged 28 and had already voted twice when I travelled to London. Influenced by our hard-won franchise and by the writings of Walt Whitman and Henrik Ibsen, my political ideas were well-developed. My studies and skills in music acting and elocution, not in hat tying, gave me chances to perform in many places, including what is now Wigmore Hall. I was well acquainted with a fellow South Australian and elocutionist, Lionel Logue, who helped the king to overcome his stutter. I'm immodest enough to tell you that I had a great deal of success as a performer, but I did not move in British royal circles. <laughs> Through journalism, I met George Bernard Shaw and the most famous anarchist of the time, P Prince Peter Kropotkin. They both encouraged me to use my skills for something more meaningful by claiming that art is not an end of life, but a means. As a result, I felt compelled to help British women achieve the voting rights we had won in Australia. The term suffragette was born in 1906 to describe militant women fighting for voting rights. Strictly speaking, I was, not a su I was, I was a suffragist, not a suffragette. I joined the Women's Freedom League, which although it was a strong opponent of the status quo, members did not agree with using violent means. I did, however, become a strong activist. Women in London were unable to view the action in Parliament because of a separating grill. Many wanted that grill removed. In 1908, a friend and I chained ourselves to the grill under our clothes. Police could not be seen undressing maids, so they removed the grill with us still chained to it. Objective achieved. Mind you, I made good use of my strong acting voice while this was happening, and in effect, I became the first woman to speak in the British Parliament. One up for the colonials. Through a later incident on that night of October 28, 1908, I was charged with obstructing police and imprisoned for a month in Holloway Jail. That did not dent my resolve. I worked for prison reform. In 1909, I hired a Zeppelin from which were dropped circulars saying, votes for women. I went back to Australia in 1910 and toured to assist states yet to be granted the vote on state issues. On return to Europe, I married in 1914 and later studied education with Maria Montessori. I worked with mothers and poor children of Lambeth in London. 
After suffrage was granted to British women, I stood for Parliament. I was unsuccessful, but I felt that my life had been well spent in assisting the struggle and in campaigning for peace. Yes, I mattered. South Australians thought I mattered. They have established a Muriel Matters Society. Yes, Muriel Matters. She matters because she was fighting for fairness. And yes, Muriel Matters. She was gussy and gorgeous and gay. A girl from the South where crow eaters abide. A girl from the South whose passion and pride took the vote for the vote to women worldwide. Yes, Muriel Matters. Yes, Muriel Matters. She matters because she was fighting for fairness. And yes, Muriel Matters. She was gutsy and gorgeous and gay. Matters and Fox thought it was not right That in a Parliament House a grill blocked their sight Chains under their frills to the grill held them tight Yes, Muriel Matters Victorian modesty came to their aid Coppers couldn't be seen undressing a maid The grill was removed, a win for the crusade Yes, Muriel Matters Yes, Muriel matters. She matters because she was fighting for fairness. And yes, Muriel matters. She was gutsy and gorgeous and gay. Out of a zeppelin floating on high, her women's vote circulars fell from the sky. The vote came to pass for the Brits by and by. Yes. Muriel matters. Yes, Muriel matters. She matters because she was fighting for fairness. And yes, Muriel matters. She was gutsy and gorgeous and gay. And we should remember her name. Uh, 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 I am Queensland uh, uh, Premier uh, Robert uh, uh, Philp. I want to introduce a bill that uh, 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 proposes uh, all Queensland adults would have the vote, but men who had uh, uh, fathered two or more legitimate children will have two votes. <laughs> and women are supposed to be the illogical sex. Huh. His bill never got up. And I think it wasn't the only thing what didn't get up. I came claim some credit for its failure. The bill, I mean. <laughs> because I campaigned against it, and some credit must belong to my father, a Chartist who influenced me to be a rebel against the social order. In England, as the eldest child, I would accompany him to meetings. 16 miles from home. Walking. Can you imagine that? Walking. And home again. Just as well I was brought up tough. When their father died, I supported my four children in Manchester by sewing for 12 hours a day, six days a week. Oh. After I migrated to Australia and the death of my second husband, I married Andrew Miller. I became Emma Miller. Then, after years of campaigning, old mother Miller. Australian suffragist. That's me. I was proud of my title, the grand old Labour woman of Queensland. My motto was a paraphrase of a part of Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man. The world is my country. To do good is my religion. In 1890, I helped form a female workers' union mainly of tailoresses, and in 1891, I marched with the shearers' strike prisoners, and I was jailed. <laughs> when released, I travelled west, organising for the Australian Workers' Union. 
by 1902, yes, we women had a federal vote, but could not vote in Queensland state elections. I fought for equal pay and an equal opportunity for all women. One of my strongest supporters was Labor politician J.S. Collins. My militant activism was most apparent on Black Friday of the 1912 strike in Brisbane. I led a large contingent of women to Parliament House, braving the batons of foot and mounted police. When Police Commissioner Cale, mounted on his thoroughbred, reared up in front of me with a raised baton, I was so enraged and frightened that I pulled a hat pin out of me hat and thrust it forward. I wish I'd got him, but I got his horse. Cale was thrown and injured. I never meant that to happen, but I confess I was more sorry for the horse. <laughs> 76 and five stone five. It's time she took a spell. But no more. Once more she's out to strive for the cause she loves so well. Out once more, truth's home to drive and show up Tory tricks. Emma Miller, five stone five at age 76. Honour her for the fight she's fought in battles lost and won. No reward she has ever sought, save the thought of duty done. And still she's out to serve, to strive, in the bitter fray to mix. Emma Miller, five stone five, age 76. My hatred of militarism led me to take an energetic part in the anti-conscription campaigns as president of the Queensland's branch of the Women's Peace Army. If women had not had the vote, what would have been the result of the conscription referendum? I ask you. Old Mother Miller with a big black hat on, more than a match for a copper with a bat on. Born a rebel, born to win, but don't trust her with a long hat pin. Old Mother Miller with a big black hat on, more Old than Mother a Miller with a big black with a bat on, more than, than a match for a born to win, but don't ask her with a born to win, but don't ask her with a long hat with a big black hat on, more than a match for a couple with a bat on, born a rebel, born to win, but don't ask her with a born to win, but don't trust her with a long hat pin, don't trust her with a long hat pin. With daring and dignity, they had to fight opponents like these. If you don't want to believe in reincarnation, don't look at the next image. Some women today have to fight opponents like these. <laughs> yes, although positive changes and attitudes have happened, some new damaging ones have appeared. Hopefully this show will fill gaps of knowledge about Australia's suffragists' quest for equality. Hopefully the example set by these women of worth from last century will help people take the next steps along the way to a more balanced society worldwide. Perhaps the songs will be given voice from others to help the knowledge to live on, an education tool. Education, it was the necessary ingredient then and it is still the necessary ingredient. All of these women would have given a Gonski or whatever other phrase for education funding reform is called. And the other necessary ingredient was cooperation. The suffragists showed and said, support of women by women is the way to bring change for all women. There are women alive today who do not have the political rights that we have. And perhaps each of us could find a way to support women like 15-year-old Malala Yousafzai, shot in the head by the Taliban, for her fight for education. This show was written to inform Australian women of the inheritance won for them by the dames and daredevils of democracy. And there is still a task to inform many of the women 
many of them, of the women since who have carried on that task. There is scope for many more songs, more shows, more works. And then as now there was and is the need for support from men, that is, good blokes. Now as then we will all need to cooperate and survive in this rapidly changing and damaged world. The final song is called Cooperation. The women needed it and used it, and our future will demand it from us too. The song has a chorus that asks for cooperation and participation. See how you go. It's easy. It's folk music. <laughs> Singing gratitude for these 10 resilient, intelligent, compassionate and daring women. When people try cooperation, they will need determination, and it won't be a vacation. Every day they'll need to say, Stand together, stand together.
global, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.